So it was September of 2007. I'd had this conversion. I'd been in the darkness, an agnostic, alcoholic, and I had an incredible conversion in my life that led me into the seminary. It was a bit of a whirlwind. And I was in the seminary about three weeks in, and I was at mass, and all of a sudden it hit me. They believe this is Jesus. Like, I came to this realization. I mean, I had a whirlwind conversion, and the Lord brought me into the seminary, and it was God's grace, but I did not have in my heart the doctrine of the real presence of the Eucharist. So I'm in my third week of the seminary, probably in September, and I start to have this confrontation in my heart. Because the Eucharist, it was a big deal. Every day we'd have the monstrance on the altar. We'd spend an hour in front of it, the practice of a holy hour, the mass. I mean, it just happened. I wound up in the seminary, a seminarian that's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to have to work this out. So I went to my spiritual director, Father Paul Berg. Raise your hand if you know Father Paul Berg. He's a brilliant, he's gone to glory, I pray now. I mean, I believe Father Berg's probably in glory already. He's gone to the Lord, and he was a brilliant philosopher, this beautiful heart for the poor. I remember he was our basketball coach, too, which brought out a different side of him. You know, <laughs> you know we, we were the Sacred Heart Major Seminary Lions, and, uh, and when, we'd, when we'd be on a fast break and something would go good, he, he was Irish and he loved Notre Dame, he'd yell, Go Irish! <laughs> And then one time somebody, he stopped practice and he said, he said, right now, we got too many coaches and not enough players. And uh, one of our brother seminarians said, what's wrong with that, coach? And he paused and in the philosopher way, he said, that is a question that will haunt the universe for eternity. <laughs> Use that with your kids. Is that not the best response? That's a question that will haunt the universe for eternity. So I go to Father Paul Berg, this incredible holy man in his 80s, just awesome. And I'm just telling him, Father Berg, I don't know about this Eucharist situation. I love Jesus, but I don't know. Like, and Father Berg said, I'm expecting some great philosophical diatribe. And he goes, well, he said, this is my body. This is my body. If he said it's his body, it's his body. <laughs> and then he proceeded to tell me a moment of awe and wonder from his own ministry. He was celebrating Mass and he was giving out Holy Communion. And he said this 10-year-old boy was behind his friend, about 10 years old. And Father Berg said to the person, he said, the body of Christ. And this 10-year-old boy right behind him, the, his friend, said, Wow. And there was something in that moment that pierced the heart of Father Paul Berg. The awe and the wonder of a child just looking up and, wow, if that's the body of Christ. I can't explain that child's reaction away, but I know that this 80-some-year-old man, one of the most brilliant people I know, when talking about the real presence, took Jesus at his word and gave a witness of an experience of somebody responding to the Eucharist, a, a child. And so I began to pray, Lord, if that's you, you have to show me. Please, I don't want to worship bread. And this is clearly a big part of the Catholic faith. And that first year in the seminary, I was just learning Catholicism. Great place to learn the Catholic faith. <laughs> and, um, and also somewhat flying under the radar, hoping like they're not going to notice. <laughs> so, but the Lord began to give the conviction that it was truly him. And I started to really, my second year in the seminary, I started to love daily adoration. Getting up and starting the day with Jesus, it's still my favorite way to start the day. Wake up and say, good morning, Jesus, I love you. Good morning, Father, good morning, Holy Spirit. And just starting the day with Jesus and then get to, uh, you know, as Fulton Sheen said, drink your coffee. If you like coffee, he said, drink your coffee, do your holy hour. So a little prayer fuel. So. Getting, I still love every morning to get right in front of the Eucharist and just spend an hour, just spend an hour face to face with Jesus and just be with my friend, be with our friend. That's one of the blessings of the priesthood is you live like right down the hall from the tabernacle usually. So I have no excuse. Um, but this parish, praise God, and many parishes have like shrine. Can I get a woo woo from my shrine friends? <laughs> oh, you crazy shrine friends. <laughs> so there was, there was a joke called Oats. 
only at the shrine. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've heard that saying, shrine friends, only at the shrine. No, I, I was so blessed to be with you guys. I, there's Father Ryan Adams and I, we kid, there's an S-shaped hole in our heart. It's just such an awesome community of God. And uh, places like Shrine and here have great devotion to the Eucharist. So you may not have the tabernacle down the hall, but God willing, you have great access to Eucharistic devotion. And uh, I had this conviction I, that it was him. And I could tell that when I'd go to, the, go to adoration and leave, it was... I was better. I just would, could absorb and, and get this divine radiance from the Lord. And my heart would always be lightened with whatever was going on. And I actually was uh, going to Alcoholics Anonymous up until my third year in the seminary. I had a real serious problem when I went through my conversion. And I was being healed of it. Like, it was broken off of me, the addiction. Like, I didn't, I didn't have the craving to drink or anything like that. And, uh, but it was still part of my my walk with the Lord in formation as part of my human formation was working the 12-step program. Side note, the Catholic Church has made some comments about Alcoholics Anonymous. It is not, you know, whereas it does have Christian roots, uh, there is some problems with like, you know, not acknowledging sin, so to say, but it was a help in my life. So, you know, God can work through imperfect vessels, imperfect instruments as well. The guy who wrote the 12 steps, and the big book, which is kind of like the little Bible of AA. Side note, this is fascinating. He was a Christian. And his wife was reading the, the big book as he was writing it. And she got mad at him. He was trying to make it really accessible to people. So he was pulling out God in various parts. And, he, and his wife, this is so cool. His wife said to him, you forgot who got you sober. And she made him leave the house for a time. Like didn't separate or kick him out. And he came back in and he was finishing writing the 12 steps in a closet under the stairs. There was maybe something in the house he needed to, he's, he's writing and he stopped at 12 steps. And if you've never heard this, it's stunning. It was either Bob or Bill W. I can't remember which one, the two founders. They stopped at 12 steps and he said, if Jesus had 12 apostles, that's enough for us. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Can we just give Jesus a hand? I mean, there's a wisdom. There's a wisdom to those 12 steps. There really is. And then, you know what's wild? The fourth one is you make a fearless, searching moral inventory of yourself. The fifth step is you confess your wrongs to another. Sound familiar? That's nuts. That's the sacrament of confession. It's so beautiful. I love when somebody who's heard my past says, I'd like to make my fourth and fifth step with you. I said, bring it on, baby. You know? It's so good one to receive the gift of absolution. But my third year in the seminary, still going to AA, I realized I can't, I can't in good conscience say anymore, my name is Patrick and I'm a recovering alcoholic. I had to come to face to face with the truth that who the sun sets free is free indeed. And I don't mean any judgments on anybody or the way that they would process the AA program. I just know I came face to face with Jesus and he was basically saying to me, Patrick, I don't want you to call yourself things that I don't call you. If I've healed you, you're healed. And I, I came to realize that my holy hour and daily communion, that was my medicine and I didn't need to head to those meetings anymore that the Lord was calling me to give my heart and my time to him in this way. And that yes, you're called to help people because the 12th step is you help people. But I'm calling you to be a shepherd and to help people in another way. I want you to pour your time out in different areas. It was awesome, all because of the Eucharist. You know, this healing journey with Jesus. And side note, sometimes people will say, um, is I, you know, how do you do with alcohol or whatnot? I, I get to drink on the job. I do great with alcohol. <laughs> it's different. It's his precious blood. And that's the, what I say is I say, if it's his precious blood, I'm all right. <laughs> but the rest of it I offer as a sacrifice to Jesus. And by his grace, I, I never have temptations like to drink alcohol. I, I just don't. I crave his precious blood. But that's different as we know, you know. Praise God. So, so I was on this 30-day silent retreat. I've been journeying with the Eucharist for a few years after coming in three weeks into the seminary and saying, ah, 
<laughs> I don't, as one of my friends says, my priest friend, he's like, I'm not going to be celebrate if that's bread, <laughs> you know, the Catholic priesthood. So you lay down your life, you, you give your life over to the Lord and the Eucharist is the source and the summit. It's a big deal if it's his body and his blood. And so I have this great development with the Eucharist and I go on a 30-day silent retreat. Would you raise your hand if you've ever been on a, a, any form of a silent retreat? Okay, you know. You know. Oh my gosh. When things get silent, things really get going, don't they? Holy smokes. And let me see if there's any, anybody who's done a 30-day silent retreat. If you'll raise your hand. It's, you know, it's a really, it's another planet. Um, no, it's beautiful. And on this 30-day silent retreat, like there were graces that happened that if you ever get the chance, I'd recommend it. But I know our rhythm of life. If you can do a three-day silent retreat, hallelujah. An eight-day, awesome. So I was at the cross. And thank God for the gift of our imagination. It's so beautiful that the Holy Spirit can take our imagination and bring us. We know Father John preaches from a heart that loves Ignatian contemplation. He gets images and goes into scenes with the Lord and hears. It's the gift of our imagination that brings us into these encounters, right? It's so beautiful, like the scenes of the gospel. Quite often God speaks to us in our thoughts, right in our thoughts. Sorry, I haven't looked over there much. How you doing? You doing okay? Cool. All right, we're good. Leave us alone. Good to see you guys. Anybody over there? No. Okay. So... You place yourself in the scene as Ignatian contemplation. And I'm, if, oh, I pray that you do this. And I pray, I bet you have done this. Go to the cross and watch Jesus lift it up. This is why it's so good to have a crucifix right above the altar. <sighs> Mother Teresa said in the, when you look at a crucifix, you see how much he loved you then. When you look at the Eucharist, you see how much he loves you now. And he's lifted up. And I'm standing by God's grace. Because you know about Kairos, right? Since I can't move around, I'll jump up and down because I can't keep it in. You know about Kairos. That's God's sense of time. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church literally teaches to God every moment of time, past, present, and the future, is present to God in its immediacy. Would you say in its immediacy? In its immediacy. So he can bring us into these moments. It's the gift of the mystery of the sacrament of the Eucharist. The paschal mystery that his death, his resurrection, his passion, death, and resurrection are before us. All of it is before God. The mystery of God's sense of time. And so I'm in this meditation and he brings me right in front of the crucifix. I was a little bit off left. And I'm looking up at the crucifix and the centurion's there and I'm watching Jesus die on the cross. And he turns his head down to the right and looks me straight in the eyes. And he says to me, it was worth it. And when he said, it was worth it. I knew in my heart and my mind that Jesus Christ knew me and all my sins, all my darkness, all my addiction, all the carnage of my life. He knew me and he died for me so that I could be free. It was and is the most intoxicating love that I have ever tasted. And I know that's the truth for you, that Jesus Christ, who is God, and whom all time is present to, knew us from the cross and in his goodness can communicate that reality to us 
on an interior experiential, I know what it is to hug and kiss. I know what it is to feel and taste your saving love. The retreat unfolded, and I was at Emmaus. And at Emmaus, Jesus was doing something. I hear he's good with his hands. He's working on something. And, I, and Jesus is a friend. He's playful, right? He's serious when he needs to be with me, but he loves to joke with me too. And he's working on something and he won't let me see it. And I'm just like, what is that? And this is a riveting scene, you know? And he finally takes, he takes what he's been carving and he hands it to me. And on the carving, there's an image. I can still see it of the crucifix. And there's me standing down below to the right, looking up at him. And on this carving, this wood plaque, he had carved in there the greatest love story ever told. And I took this and I just jammed it up against my heart. I just wanted it. I can't, I don't know, I just was overwhelmed. And I'm holding it on my heart and I'm just overwhelmed by this gift that Jesus has given me. I just don't want to let it go. And Jesus says to me, do you want me to put it in you? And I said, yes. And I handed it back to him. And he handed me a little white host. He handed me the Eucharist. And while I had had a developing devotion to Jesus in the Eucharist, in this 30-day silent retreat, he was taking it to a whole nother place that receiving the Eucharist is receiving the gift of his outpouring on the cross in a mighty, life-changing way every single time. And later, I would come to find, as I'm reading Fulton Sheen, that Fulton Sheen said, the greatest love story ever is contained in a tiny white host. Now, Fulton Sheen's a pretty awesome disciple of Jesus, but in my heart, I was like, he told me that. He told me that, Fulton. He told me. I was just so happy. I was like, oh my gosh, that guy's awesome. Like, this must, we must be on the right road here. Praise be Jesus. And the love story began long ago. Began long ago. Praise you, Jesus. With God, Father, Son, and Holy. It's so hard to stand still. It's uh, with Father, Son. I might give it a go. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being together. As we heard in the Gospel of John, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. was the word in the beginning was the word and the word was with God never work thank you Jesus uh, it's like being punished I'm just kidding I'm kidding so it's not a big deal so um, no it's not in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and we know oh look at that and we know that uh, <laughs> freedom so we know that the Logos, you know, long story short, in the Greek, it's the Father and the Son gazing at each other with perfect love and the Holy Spirit's in there. This incredible, overwhelming community of perfect love. And they say, let us make man in our image and likeness. And we get made these incredible people that have this intellect to be made in his image and his likeness. To have an intellect to taste and to know love and a free will that can choose it. And then God... He makes them male and female in his divine image. He created them. I love that passage in Genesis 127. In his divine image, he created them. This is one of the most helpful lines for people that struggle with lust. In his divine image, he created them. That's like, that's God's divine image. Look out, you know. Praise God. So would you say in his divine image, he created them? Ready? In his divine image, he created them. Then he takes them and he sets them in a garden an enclosed, an in garden. And Adam and Eve, 
you know, it says, remember that passage in, a in Acts? That's the New Testament. In Genesis 2.25, listen to this. The man and his wife were both naked, yet they felt no shame. They felt no shame. They're, they're free. They have nothing on their heart, nothing on their mind that is contrary to the life of God and the thought of God, the love of God. They're free. They, it, it must have been intoxicating. My 91-year-old priest friend, Monsignor John Hall, I was at spiritual direction with him yesterday. At the end he says, what time is it? And I said, it's 11.04. And I guess mass starts at 11. And he's 91. He's like, oh, he pops up. And I took a video of this and sent it to my priest friends. I was like, that's what we need to be like, guys. And he's like, Yeah, John Hall. Thank you, Jesus. Like, it's intoxicating. This 91-year-old man passionately hustling to get to the Eucharist. Isn't that awesome? Don't you want to live like that? Hallelujah. Like, more seasons with the life going deeper and deeper. This intoxication and the garden. This is God's desire. You know, we know the scriptures end with a wedding, the wedding feast of the Lamb. It's God's desire that we would live intoxicated with his love, living in the greatest love story ever. Would you say it? Living in the greatest love story ever. That is the fastest way to evangelize. Just get happy in love. Walk into the gas station, walk into the family gathering with joy and love and be present to the people in front of you and they're going to notice something's up. Why are you so happy? Can I tell you my secret? <laughs> you know, like, I'm in love. <laughs> See, literally, like, I, Jesus is thrilling my heart. And, uh, hey, he loves you infinitely. Is there anything we can pray for? It's a, the, just the fastest way I find in, in getting into the place of grace and evangelization. Love, fruits of the Holy Spirit, crazy joy. And sometimes it's been too crazy. But anyways, crazy joy. <laughs> So, I don't know you. So, it's okay. But, and then ask, is there anything I can pray for? Because God loves to show up when we pray for people. He loves to show up. Okay, hey, can we just pray right now? Oh, you start praying for somebody. You just ask them, how you doing? How you, 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 your thoughts, anything going on? You feeling good? Yeah, I just feel joy. I feel so good. Like, that's what Jesus wants for you, friend. Hey. You know, if you want to find a church on Sunday, I promise you he'll surprise you when you walk in. Just the joy and the love, the intoxication of a life of love. This was God's desire for us from the beginning, that we would live in this intimacy of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I like to think about the Jewish rabbis, when they're filling in gaps, when they're speculating about certain things, they call it midrash. They would midrash. I wonder... How many nights did Adam and Eve go to bed under the stars? Absolutely full, saying, God, I love you. How many mornings did they wake up just in the joy? You know, maybe Eve running off in the morning like, I'm going to hang out with God. Because yeah, they had this intimacy, this access and the Eucharist gives us all that renewed again and again and again. We know we were given his indwelling, praise you God, indwelling presence through the gift of the Holy Spirit at baptism. And then, love has always been a choice. With the intellect and the free will, they continue to choose God on a daily basis. And we hear that they weren't alone because the devil and the fallen angels in a, I can't understand it, but the devil and the fallen angels, we call them demons and evil spirits as well, they rejected God, and they have perfect intellect. I can't understand it. I can't. Why they would reject God, but they've made a definitive rejection of God, and it definitively deformed them. They lost their place in heaven. The scriptures tell us very clear, St. Michael, there was a battle, and they cast him out of heaven, and now, 
as Peter said, the devil pours around like a roaring lion looking for souls to devour. The Eucharist, Eucharist is a refuge. It's a strength for warriors. I can't remember who said it, but when we get near that table, man, the, the devil trembles. St. John Chris Ostom said, let us leave this table like lions breathing fire. Terrifying to the devil. He has prepared a table before me in the sight of my enemies. And as we come to the Eucharist, just, oh no, oh no, and oh no. They're about to get free, and they're about to get about the mission of setting captives free. I can't understand the devil's hatred, but I trust my best friend who said, the devil came only to steal, kill, and destroy. He's been a liar from the beginning. Don't listen to him. And Eve hears his voice. We don't know how long it had been, but he slips in and begins to lie his butt off. And I want to just, it's so worth mentioning right now because we see the blueprint for sin. Would you say that? We see the blueprint for sin in Eve's and Adam's fall that it's the mind. It is the mind. Our thoughts. This is the battleground for disciples of Jesus. You know, it's been playfully said that, that discernment 101 involves knowing that there's three sources for our thoughts. The Holy Spirit, the human, I'm tired, I need a sandwich, whatnot, and the evil one. And the evil one can't read our minds, thank you Jesus, but he can throw thoughts at us. And Five minutes of watching TV will give us a clear, oh, yeah, that's, that's not just human. That's demonic, like that thing that you just saw. So um, I don't mean to be extreme. Um, throw your TV out today. But, you know, there's a lot of great stuff, a lot of great stuff on there too. St. Maximilian Colby room back there. And uh, a neurologist was at Mass at the cathedral, and the guy who works on brains, and I, ca I caught him at the end. I said, hey, doc, tell me something I can eat that's really good for my brain. This was so awesome. The neurologist stops, and he smiles, and he points at the tabernacle. And he said, eat that. <laughs> that's brain food. <laughs> that's brain food. <laughs> Praise you, Jesus. Yeah, Jesus, we like brain food. Yeah. You know, the meal that intoxicates. And Eve, when she hears his voice, when she hears these lies, the, the devil's voice, and she says yes to it, and then Adam says yes to it, chaos ensues. They lose that intimacy with God. They're hiding. They're, you know, they're clothing. The, 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 the analogy of shame coming in now, expressed through the clothing. And God responds. And I, I, I imagine you know this passage very well. It's called the Proto-Evangelium, the first proclamation of the gospel. And it's in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. But first, previously above that, we hear in verse 14, Then the Lord God said to the serpent. So God addresses this creature of his that once was beautiful, Satan. God addresses this creature that God made and has now done something tremendously destructive to God's most precious creation, humanity made in his image and likeness. And God, one of the things God says to Satan is, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. He will strike at your head. He will strike at your head while you strike at his heel. And so God's response, that's a prophecy of what, what God would do on the cross. Jesus would do on the cross. He will strike at your head. Jesus will crush Satan's head while Satan strikes at his heel. It looked like Satan had conquered, 
destroying Jesus Christ on the cross. But in actuality, he was just nipping at his heel. As St. Ephraim said, Jesus had effectively found a chariot to the underworld upon which he would break the back of Satan and sin and death. God's response to sin. I will pour myself out for you. I will pour myself out for you. I will pour myself out for you. And that's what happened on the cross. St. John would say, John who laid his head against the heart of Jesus would say, this is how we came to know love, that he laid down his life for us. Our very concept of love is defined by knowing Jesus and how he laid his life down on the cross for us. And every time we receive the Eucharist, we are renewed and given a fresh experience of that intimate outpouring of God's love. That like St. John, we can say, this is how I came to know love. You can go about your day glowing with divine joy because you came to know love afresh. We know we need it again and again and again. It's his wisdom that we have it again and again and again. And as we fast forward out of the garden, and we'll come back to the garden later, but as we fast forward out of the garden, we go through Genesis chapter 22, verse 8. We, we stop with Abraham for a moment, the father in faith, Abraham who was about to give his son Isaac, and that passage is when the angel says, hold your hand, I'm paraphrasing, and God himself will provide the sacrifice. God himself will provide the sacrifice. We move through Moses as Old Testament history unfolds, the story of salvation, this love story. Moses, who he gets so close to God that his face glows, and God brings him into this intimacy on the mountain and says, tell these people they'll be my dear possession. God is this lavish lover of souls, and it's for each and every one of us. I want them. I don't want anything between me and them. Tell them if they follow my statutes and decrees, they'll be a people dearer to me than any on the face of the earth. And so the old covenant happens, and we move into the time. Joshua leads them into this promised land, this beautiful place. And then the, the time of the judges come, and on to the kings of Israel. And we just make a brief pause in the salvation history journey with King David in 2 Samuel when God told him, I'll just paraphrase because I want to hit the runway here, they, that an heir from your loins will reign forever. His kingdom will never end. The prophecy given in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13, to David that his kingdom, the Davidic kingdom, there would be an heir and he would reign forever. And it's a prophecy about Jesus. And as we move in salvation history, we stop with Isaiah at Isaiah 7, 14, who said those stunning words, the virgin shall be with child. We move through to Jeremiah 31 when God says stunning words that must have captivated everybody at the Last Supper. The days are coming when I will make a new covenant with my people. That's a big deal because the old covenant was pretty big and pretty hardy and defined God's relationship with his people. And for God to say, I will make a new covenant and later Jesus would say, it is an eternal covenant. Oh, would you say the new and eternal covenant with me? This never ends. Can you believe it? It's phenomenal what God has done. And we arrive in Bethlehem where this beautiful, I can't wait to see Mary face to face in heaven one day. I, and this is not creepy at all. I've just heard she's, like in person, I've heard she's just stunningly radiant. And it's not like a, uh, this world. So anyways, you know what I'm getting at. Like our beautiful mother, the face of our shining, radiant mother. I can't wait to see her face to face. It's going to be amazing. She's there, and she's already heard from this angel that you're going to name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And Joseph is there. And we know Joseph has had a dream. And the, 
the angel told Joseph in a dream, you're going to name him Jesus. Can you imagine when it came time when they were like, okay, so we're going to name him. And, and at the same time, they look at each other, Jesus. They each knew his name before they talked about it, right? Isn't that amazing? Like they each knew. And his name means he will save his people from their sins. And he's born in Bethlehem. And I know there's people in here who know what that means in Hebrew. What does it mean? House of bread. He's born in Bethlehem. And as his life begins to unfold, as he grows up, it's clear he knows who he is at 12 years old when he says, you know, the roughly 12, when he says, did you not know I must be in my father's house? And then when he publicly begins his first public messages, we hear in the gospel of Matthew, he says, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. The other translation, it's in Mark, he says, God. In Matthew, we hear, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus Christ has come to bring fallen humanity back into the garden of intimacy with God. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when he came, he brought his world with him. And in the simplest ways, talking to a shamed woman at a well on the hot noonday sun who had five husbands, in the simplest ways, just having a conversation with somebody broken and telling her she can be restored. He invades the brokenness of this world in the most spectacular of ways. And to cite one example, we go to Matthew 15. When Jesus, we hear... In Matthew 15, they're bringing people to him all day long with sicknesses. And not just the flu or influenza. Great crowds came to him, having with them the lame, the blind, the deformed, the mute, and many others. They placed them at his feet, and he cured them all. Jesus held the greatest healing services ever. People, what was the response? The crowds were amazed when they saw the mute speaking, the deformed made whole, the lame walking, the blind able to see, and they glorified God. He just invades this broken world with his intoxicating love and his presence. And that happens again and again every time we receive the Eucharist. And then, there's a couple of tender moments that I want to touch on with Jesus the bridegroom. In Isaiah, pardon me, in Matthew chapter 9, John's disciples come to him. John the Baptist's disciples. These are guys that were probably good buddies of Jesus. Jesus probably saw them and was like, I love these guys. John the Baptist is like my, I don't want to play favorites, but John the Baptist is, there's no man born greater of a woman on earth than he, right? Jesus said that. He clearly had a love and a respect and an esteem for John the Baptist. And John the Baptist's disciples come to him and they say, why do we and the Pharisees fast much, but your disciples are having a party? No, he said, why? Oh, I love Holy Spirit parties. Why do, we and the, why do we and the Pharisees fast much, but your disciples do not fast? What a tender moment. Jesus, we're working our butts off. I'm starving, man. We're, we're taking a pretty heavy hit in this asceticism. And your guys are running around, hooting and hollering, maybe. Hosanna! <laughs> it's a Hebrew hoot. You know, it's a Hebrew victory cry. Hebrew victory cry. Let's give a Hebrew victory cry to, to God. Ready? One, two, three. Hosanna! That's what they did when he was coming into Jerusalem. We can do it in the church. One, two, three. Hosanna! Oh, doesn't it feel good? Maybe one more time for that spot in your deep in you that just needs to get, you know, get a shot of his love. One, two, three. Hosanna! Woo! Somebody over there, I'm going to go give a hug and probably get electrocuted. Thank you, Jesus. So he says to them, can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom, oh, two minutes, can the wedding guests mourn 
as long as the next time you got to come across like this. <laughs> Can the wedding guests mourn? Don't you love family? We get to have fun together. That's what the new covenant is, a sacred family relationship. So can the wedding guests mourn when the bridegroom is with them? And he's hearkening back to a beautiful passage in Isaiah 62. God says, no more shall men call you forsaken to the Israelites, his people, but this would be the fulfillment of the new covenant or your land desolate. But you shall be called my delight and your land espoused. For the Lord delights in you and makes your land his spouse. Here it is. As a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. Say it with me, church. As a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. You got to do it once more. As a young man marries a virgin, your builder shall marry you. And as a bridegroom rejoices in his bride, so shall the Lord your God rejoice in you. It's wild. In the Old Testament, God says, I'm going to marry my people. Yeah, it's awesome. And then when Jesus shows up and says, I'm the bridegroom, it's got a context. God is consistent. He has a plan. And then we get to the end of the story. Oh, hallelujah. He says, notes are, he says, um, notes are a funny thing. You, you put a plan together and then you realize, like, you, you went to Florida via Los Angeles. Anyways, so... <laughs> But I felt the Holy Spirit just tell me this morning, let me be creative. Like, okay, you got it. Like, you know, just to, yeah, thank you. So here it comes, Revelation 19. Are you ready? This is the end. A voice coming from the throne. John's looking into heaven. And a voice coming from the throne. Pray, he hears, praise our God, all you his servants. And you who revere him, small and great. Then I heard something like the sound of a great multitude or the sound of a rushing water or mighty pearls of thunder. This is the power and the love of God coming at you every time you come forward for Holy Communion. And he hears, Alleluia, the Lord has established his reign, our God, the Almighty. This is a voice speaking from heaven. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding day of the Lamb has come. Would you say it? The wedding day of the Lamb has come. Why are you so happy? Because the wedding day of the Lamb has come, and I taste it, and I live it. Hallelujah. His bride has made herself ready. She was allowed to wear a bright, clean linen garment. The linen represents the righteous deeds of the holy ones. Oh, you get transformed from glory to glory into the image of the Son, and you bring it out into the world, the righteous deeds of the holy ones. Then the angel said to me, write this down. Blessed are those who have been called to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he said to me, these words are true. They come from God. And the greatest love story ever continues. And it's our choice, just like Adam and Eve could choose to live in the intoxicating love of God to live it out every day. And he's given us the most precious gift. Hey, come over here. I'm going to give you everything. What do you mean, Jesus? My body, my blood, my soul, and my divinity. I'm going to pour it into you. When, Jesus? Well, the Roman Latin Rite Catholic Church says you can receive Holy Communion twice in a day, but if you're Eastern Rite, have a field day. 19 times. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, Hallelujah. Can I get that from a Chaldean brother or sister? Anybody here? Chaldeans in the house? Chaldean Catholics? They got, yeah, you guys know how to get down. Okay, praise God. Shime, baba, brona, roja, kocha. All right. All right. Last thing, friends. And then we'll conclude this first reflection and figure out how on earth to stay on schedule. Okay. I asked the Father what he wanted you to hear in this reflection. Like what the, and he just put some words on my heart in addition to what I was sharing. And, uh, and then, oh, time is up. Here we go. This is the very end. Thank you. I'm sorry. Praise you, Jesus. Father, what did you want your sons and daughters to know? And here's what I heard. And I'll be nice and loud if you want to close your eyes. My insatiable thirst for you can't be quenched on this side of eternity. No. Not until you are fully in me forever. This is the destiny I've desired for you. 
and for every person I have ever created. The Eucharist is eternity's embrace here and now. I delight to share this with you. My son's heart is thrilled by souls that receive him passionately in the Eucharist. The Holy Spirit becomes a symphony director of beauty in the love embrace of the Eucharist that is the delight of lovers of me. A delight which is fueled by the realization and reception of my passionate love made present and poured out continuously in the Eucharist for you, my child. And now, friends, I'm about to invite Margie forward for uh, uh, some instructions, but I want to invite you, this mini-retreat, I don't know how long our break will be, maybe 10. I promise I'll do whatever I need to do the second part to keep us on schedule. I'll just do 20 minutes or something. I'm fine with anything. But here's something. God has grace for everybody here. And just a few options of what you can do with your precious 10 minutes. Or maybe you'll make a decision and say, we'll give them 15 and you be shorter. I'm willing, I'll give so you can, you know, so we can take more time with God. It's, it's a retreat experience, conference retreat. So you can ask the Lord. If you want to slip off by yourself, you can say, Lord, what do you want me to focus on right now with you? Maybe you heard a word and you're supposed to sit there and focus on that with Jesus. Or you could say, maybe some of you want to go outside and just praise God. Thank you, praise you. My soul is in love with you, Jesus. Maybe you just want to go pour yourself out. The other is, you could ask him. Matthew 7, ask, seek, and knock. Ask him to ravish your soul. I want to love the Eucharist. You, I want to love you in the Eucharist like never before. I love what Fulton Sheen said. He said, I can't be chased unless you ravish me, God. It's awesome. I can't be chased unless you ravish me, God. It's so beautiful that I'd be intoxicated with you and see the world through your eyes. Or finally, if you want to talk with a friend, kingdom friendship, but I encourage this. Let it be substantive. Substantive. What did, what did you hear? What's God stirring in your heart right now? What, what do you think the Lord's doing? Just dig for a deep level of like what God's doing in our lives in this. So however long the break is, maybe we can figure that out. I invite you to take time to keep unpacking the grace and going deeper, okay? I'd like to ask Aida. I saw you and said hi to you earlier, Aida. Aida, would you please make your way forward and I'm going to ask her to give a, a brief testimony. You know, testimonies are so powerful. And I, I won't give it away, but Aida has a great testimony about how she came to believe in Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Let's give a hand to Aida for her courage to come forward. And you can stand up here. Thank you. Well, so first I have to say praise be to God because I find myself unprepared and suddenly here, but I also have to thank Julie. <laughs> so anyway, God has his own way to working that thing, so I'm just going to be in that space. Uh, I'm a new um, convert, Catholic, whatever you can call it, because I'm still um, learning the vocabulary. But um, I came into church about two years ago, right? Two years, Kristen? So, um, and <laughs> I'm a stubborn person, very much so. But in, in the RCIA, one of the programs is that we have to do the retreat. So as part of coming to the church. Now, Father Patrick mentioned the Eucharist, and um, I mentioned that I'm a stubborn person. So this Eucharist and me coming into the church was not going well with me, because I'm coming to church, and I'm like, okay, that's a piece of bread, and I have to say that. That was me. But now the retreat is approaching, and I have to to do this retreat, and I have to, to come to come to Jesus, right? <laughs> Truly come to Jesus. So uh, I, ha I had to, I made this decision of, I said, well, this Eucharist is central to the belief, to the religion, to Catholicism. 
So if I don't get the Eucharist, I'm not sure how this is going to work. I mean, just kind of walking through it. And when you have 20 years of searching, it's important when you make the decision that you're joining a church. So anyway, long story short, I went to the Adoration Chapel. Now, being me, I'm a, also a sarcastic person. Uh, and so in, I sat at the Adoration Chapel and um, I was having this um, ugly conversation now, and I'm embarrassed to share it because I was like, they tell me that you're there. I mean, literally, this, is, this was my attitude, and I don't get it. I don't know, you're there. To me, you're just a piece of bread, and I don't understand that all these smart people come to you and they think that you're Christ. Well, I came across this today, so prove it God, and he did. And the way how he did, <laughs> just don't test God, please don't test God. <laughs> just don't. <laughs> I've, I've learned the hard way, but don't. So the next thing I know is that I was overcome by a power and a presence that is beyond me. I'm a person of reason and of, of logic. I, can, I don't do mystic. I don't do metaphysical and all that stuff. I found myself on the floor. You know, when you have to leave your chair, I left my chair because I was so overwhelmed. And I bowed on the floor. And I could not lift my head for an entire hour. And the only words coming out of my heart were, thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. So, if you, if you come to church and you still think out of routine or habit that what's there is just a piece of bread, be careful. <laughs> Be careful, because it is truly the presence of God. Thank you all. And that, that testimony is just so powerful. The, the radical gift of raw power in the Eucharist, how the Lord can just overwhelm somebody, bringing them in front of the Eucharist. And there was this Unitarian pastor. Is she, I don't know, is, is there anybody here who's Catholic who used to be a Unitarian pastor? So I want to make sure I get, okay, I would let her tell the story. So she, when I was at Shrine of the Little Flower, she was driving down Woodward. Her church was up Woodward on the left-hand side. And she kept experiencing a draw to this place about Manresa. She'd drive by and just had a, you know, just was a curiosity to go there. She's driving and then finally one day she stops and she goes into the building and she's visiting and she's walking around and she makes her way into the chapel with those beautiful red chairs and the backdrop. And she sits down in the chair and she's looking at the tabernacle and, and observing this. And she hears a voice. Um, not out loud, but it was clear that it wasn't her own voice. She hear, she's looking at the tabernacle and she's sitting there and she hears, Now I can feed you. And she began the journey to discover what is this? that you want to feed me with the Eucharist. And she entered the, she went from being a Unitarian pastor to becoming a Catholic. Isn't that a remarkable story? Just the power of Jesus. I wanted to, before I forget, because I'll forget, uh, if anybody's interested in taking a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, it's next May 23rd through June 1st. And it is, the idea is we're going to celebrate Pentecost in the upper room, the location of the upper room. And the pilgrimage is being led by Dr. Mary Healy. And I get to carry her bags and say mass. So count me in, George. So I'm going I'm to have her proof every homily before I try to preach in front of her. She's my favorite scripture scholar. So I have cards down here. Um, they're sitting on that chair in the front row. If you would like to go on a pilgrimage with Dr. Mary Healy. And me too. So we'll have fun. <laughs> Put me in a room two down from that guy, please. So I asked the Father, um, you know, I asked the Father about this, this reflection of for fueling the fire.
of our mission as disciples to spread the gospel. I just, Father, what do you want the people to hear? And what I was just getting in prayer and I wrote down was, the light of the world is passionate Christian love. It makes present the light that overcomes darkness. I am the light of the world, said my son. And whoever walks behind him will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Come, children. I love how you shine. And I want to give you grace and new confidence that your gentle and kind love is exactly what a dark, wearied world and the broken-hearted need to see. I will send you. Have no fear. You were always made to be in relationship with me and to shine the light and love of this relationship to everyone and to let them know there's an open door. And Jesus said in Luke's gospel, I have come to set the earth on fire and how I wish it were already blazing. There is a baptism with which I must be baptized and how great is my anguish until it is accomplished. Jesus, there's a passion that he prophesied would be present in his church, that he, we are baptized, priest, prophet, and king. We share in the life of Christ as a priest and a prophet and a king. And he said, I long for my church to be ablaze. I long to cast fire on the face of the earth. There's a baptism with which I must be baptized. And that baptism that Jesus underwent was the passion, the death, and the resurrection that you and I were baptized into in our baptism. Paul said, are you not aware that when you were baptized, you were baptized into his death and into his resurrection? We have been baptized into the very passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And as John the Baptist said, we have been baptized. He said, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and with fire. In the days of Jesus, if you didn't have sunlight or moonlight, if you had light, you had fire. A fire that burns. And at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit showed up, he showed up in fire. Fire consumes, it melts, it molds, it just, it not molds, it just brings us. And that fire is meant to burn in each of us. Catherine of Siena, you know her famous quote, be who you're supposed to be and you will set the world ablaze that we live as citizens of another kingdom. We've been transferred from the kingdom of darkness, says St. Paul, into the kingdom of the beloved Son. We live operating by the principles of another world that you don't see with the human eye out of the gate, but is superior to this world. The kingdom of heaven is among you, Jesus said in Luke 17, 21. And he taught us in our prayer, ask for our daily bread, and that we would have the strength to do God's will on earth as it is in heaven. And it's the will of God that our hunger, our fire for carrying out the will of God as it is in heaven here on earth would be nourished, fueled by the Eucharist. That we would come to the Eucharist and be filled again and again and again. And Ita misa est. I know you all in this church probably know what that means. What is ita misa est, the old ending of the Mass? Go, she is sent. She has been sent. The church, that the Eucharist never ends when we receive and kneel and give thanks for a good period, but that we turn and we go to the world 
with a new light, a new love, a new glow, because we've just embraced the bridegroom again and given our lives to him again. And he has great plans, what he wants to do through you and through me. The power of the Eucharist. What do you live like if you have Jesus for breakfast? It's got to be different than what the world looks like. And it's exciting. And blessed are they who hunger and thirst, he said, for righteousness. You'll be satisfied. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst. I want to be filled with you, Jesus. And I want to live my life in a way that honors you. That I would look different, walk different, speak different. That I would bring your world as you brought it into the midst and people would know you and your love. The Eucharist fuels a heartfelt desire and ability to live as Jesus in this world. To not just represent him as a Christian, but to re-present him. You remember that beautiful story Matthew Kelly tells about the woman you've heard? Raise your hand if you've heard this. The fruit cart gets spilled. You can raise it as I tell it. If you've heard this, raise your hand. The fruit cart gets, I got enough not raising that I should tell it. The fruit cart gets spilled. The man's running. He's late for his flight, his friends, and he turns back. This is a true story. He turns back, and he decides, I'll miss my flight, and puts all the fruit on the stand. Now, raise your hand if you haven't heard this story. Oh, this is a gem. It's yours. He's helping this woman put the fruit back on her stand, and he sees through her tears that she's blind. And he helps her, and he gives her money and says, hey, I hope this will cover the damaged goods. And he turns to walk away, and she says to him, hey, are you Jesus? You know, to be asked, are you Christ? To be identified by the way you live, what you do. Jesus. I'll never forget a man named Earl downtown when we were doing street evangelization. And I just, just want Jesus to be known and loved and that every bit of me would be about that. That when people look at my face, when they look at your face, they would see the glow of Jesus. Lord, use our faces as a billboard for your love. And every time the Eucharist passes my lips, I think about, let my words be filled with the Holy Spirit and life. Just Holy Spirit filled words. I'm sure you've thought about that when the Eucharist, when the precious blood flows over your lips and how the letter of James says the power of life and death is in the tongue. If I make a commitment this day just to speak how the Father speaks as best as I can and to hold my tongue when it's not the case, Lord, use our faces. Let them be billboards for you. Let our, our words that have been uttered by tongues and lips that have tasted the Eucharist carry the power of your life-changing love. The power of a Christian is absolutely incredible. And when we're hungry to serve him, we know we need him. And being hungry for the Eucharist lets us know that we're hungry for what's going to give us the power. And you leave church different than you came. And there was this guy named Earl. We were street evangelizing. And this was one of the most spectacular things I've seen on the street. He was all bent over in, in bad shape. And he asked for money. And I didn't have any money. And I said to Earl, um, because he was all beat up, it just, you know, and I said, Earl, my friend Michelle was out there. I said, Do you, can, Earl, can we pray for you? And uh, I asked Michelle about a month and a half ago, do you remember that? And she said, I think about it all the time. And this, this man, Earl, he's bent over, and he'd been in a, car, a truck accident, and he had bad pain in his legs and in his back and everything, and we prayed for Earl. And we asked the Lord to straighten his spine. And Earl went like this. 
And when he stood, when he was going upright, I just knew in my heart, the Spirit was helping me to know that's God. And Earl stood upright. I waited a couple moments quietly. We commanded the pain to leave his body in the name of Jesus. And I wish every single time this happened, but it's happened enough that I know I need to keep going until I drop. Um, Earl starts walking. And I said, you know, Earl starts walking. And the th he said, he just takes a few steps and he says, I can feel my toes. You know what it's like when you have back problems, like it messes with your legs. And Earl, long story short, his back, his legs, everything is completely fine. And he's in tears. He's in tears. And he says, I'll never forget it. He says, this is scary. And I said, this is Jesus, brother. He said, I know Jesus. I've just never experienced this. <laughs> I, I pray that by the way we live and the, our ability to talk about Jesus, our best friend, that other people could experience the Eucharist like Aida and say, I believe in Jesus. I've just never experienced this. Side note, I think the main reason a lot of non-Catholic Christians and any of, any of our brothers and sisters who are non-Catholic that are here, you're a guest of honor and you're loved. I've just heard the interpretation that when Jesus says in John chapter 6 that the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life, that sometimes people will say, and it's John chapter 6 verse 63, that sometimes people will say that, see, he's not talking literally. He said, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The flesh is of no avail. But it's a, it was a Jewish idiom. When we say, don't beat around the bush, everybody knows it means get to the point. And that Jewish idiom, we saw it earlier when Peter said to Jesus, you're the, blessed, you're the son of God, the blessed one, in Matthew 16. And Jesus says to Matthew, blessed are you, Simon, son of Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. That Jewish idiom when we say don't beat around the bush, and it means get to the point, the Jewish idiom, the flesh and blood are of no avail, it is the spirit that gives life. That means you can't understand it without God's help. It's a revelation that is given to you with divine assistance. So when Jesus says about the Eucharist, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. The flesh is of no avail. He's very clearly telling them in that context and with that idiom, you're going to need help to understand this. I remember sitting with a man in marriage prep who was a very devout Christian, non-Catholic, marrying a Catholic, and we did together. It was so wonderful. We did a very slow, probably took an hour, prayerful reading of the entire chapter of John 6 together, pausing to acknowledge now, this is the second time Jesus has said, my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Now, this is the third time. You can see that people think he's referring to cannibalism and he's not backing off. That chapter alone, really, with that key verse, John 6, verse 63, I believe it's 63, reveals that when you think about, as Aida said, logically, 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 it's Jesus saying it is his body and his blood. And then when he says to the apostles, do this in memory of me, as Holy Thursday is so beautifully celebrated here, he starts the priesthood and every validly ordained priest. It's my favorite part of being a priest. There was a woman at Shrine of the Little Flower who became Catholic because she was sitting in the wings and she heard the words. I was saying mass and this just brings me to my knees that the Lord could use. He uses me. He uses you. And I said, take this, all of you, and eat of it. This is my body. And she came later and said, when you said those words, something went through me. And she ended up becoming a Catholic. Every time a priest says those words, as a priest, it's the most wonderful 
wonderful experience. I've experienced a love, a power in the confessional and at the altar that are so far beyond me. Like the atmosphere gets thick. There's plenty of times when we go to say the epiclesis, like, you know, whatever formula is used in the Eucharistic prayer, there's plenty of times I go to put out my hands and God just gives me in my heart this incredible awareness. And sometimes fire on my hands as well. Like there's something going on here. This is not just words. It's such a thrill. And then to be able to give the Eucharist, knowing that Jesus said, you will receive power when the Spirit comes upon you. And that each time the Eucharist is being given to somebody, there's about to be a covenant renewal. That the beloved bride is about to say, Amen, yes, I believe you died for me so that I could live for you. And that there's no better way to live. And maybe three minutes before we say, I'm sorry. We start Mass by saying, I'm sorry. And we say again, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof. But only say the word and my soul shall be healed. And we're just filled with the ability to love again and share his light, his words, the gospel with the world. I want to share with you for a minute some of the saints and what they would say about receiving Holy Communion and what it does. First, we go to St. Damien of Malachi. Raise your hand if you know his story. Yeah, yeah, St. Damien of Malachi wound up working in a leper colony. And uh, he, he wound up contracting leprosy. He's, and he wrote these words while he had leprosy. And he's working in a leper colony on an island. Great suffering. And he says, it is at the foot of of the altar. Think about the suffering we go through in our life. And the Eucharist is divine medicine and divine encouragement. It is at the foot of the altar that we find the strength necessary in this isolation of ours. Without the blessed sacrament, a position like mine would be unbearable. But having our Lord at my side, I continue always to be happy and content. Jesus in the blessed sacrament is the most tender of friends with souls who seek to please him. His goodness knows how to proportion itself to the smallest of his creatures as to the greatest. Be not afraid then in your solitary conversations to tell him of your miseries, your fears, your worries of those who are dear to you. Do so with confidence and with an open heart. It's thinking about Damien of Malachi going with leprosy before the Eucharist and pouring out his heart to his friend. It just reminds me that there's, there's times. What was he doing for Damien? He was removing discouragement, giving him divine encouragement. Whether we're coming to Mass and God willing and Eucharistic adoration, when we go, there's times he just wants to remove a rock from our heart. I bet there's many people in this church, I bet you've all probably had the experience when you're about to receive Eucharist, the Eucharist is held up high. This happens to me a lot, and your heart aches, and you know the, the area. Like, example, you had a disagreement with your sister-in-law, and it wasn't so good, and then at the Eucharist, your heart starts to burn, and you're like, I re you really taste and know that wasn't the love of God the way I spoke. You know what I'm saying? Can I get an Amen. Yeah, those revelations that happen in the Eucharist when he wants to remove a discouragement, give us encouragement in the difficult situations. St. Damien of Malachi, pray for us. And then St. John Vianney, he said, when we receive Holy Communion, we experience something extraordinary, a joy, a fragrance, a well-being that thrills the whole body and causes it to exalt. A joy, a well-being, a fragrance that thrills the whole body and causes it to exalt. After communion, I love to just close my eyes and sit 
And oftentimes there's this spot that Jesus and he, the Spirit brings me to where I'll just sit up against the well with Jesus. You know, the well where he met the Samaritan woman. I just find myself sitting with Jesus with my back up against the well with my best friend. Just delighting. There's times where I'll just find myself with Jesus after Holy Communion just walking through a field together and just peaceful and joyful. He fills us with this joy, this fragrance, this freshness every time we receive. I love saying goodbye to people after Mass and praying for people and stuff, and I don't think people are being nice just because you're the priest and they're, and they're Catholics. I think that, like, something's actually happened when they've received Holy Communion, you know? And I remember this one Mass at Shrine of the Little Flower. It was a Sunday, 6 p.m. It was just powerful. Every Mass is, but my experience... I just had this heightened experience that these people get it and they're filled. And I know Father John feels that way here. These people get it. And I was thinking about the world and all the news stories. And the Lord was putting on my heart after communion, like, when these doors open, there's going to be light poured out into this world. It's going to be powerful. It was, and I told the church that, man. Like, the world, it's getting dark out there. But there's about to be a release of God's power and light into the world. St. John Vianney also said, When we have been to Holy Communion, the balm of love envelops the soul as the flower envelops the bee. We're given that fresh, sweet love. It just floods us. And Mother Teresa, St. Mother Teresa of Calcutta said, Unless we believe and see Jesus in the appearance of bread on the altar, we will not be able to see him in the distressing disguise of the poor. And that is crucial, that Jesus Christ, every time we receive the Eucharist, he wants to restore our sight. We are given the Holy Spirit to share the mind of Christ, that as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, we have the mind of Christ. And every time we receive the Eucharist, the Lord wants to renew our hearts to see through his eyes. He said, come to me, all you who are weary. Take my yoke upon you. To take the yoke of Jesus is to see the world through his eyes. And he said, the eye is the light of the body, the lamp of the body. As if we'll see people the way Jesus sees people, we'll have the Father's heart for them. And they don't become an obstacle anymore, but they become a target for God's love through me and you. Whether it's a hi, opening the door for somebody, asking, can I pray for you? And we get real comfortable with knowing that we've been sent. That this outpouring of divine love on the cross made present through the Eucharist is made to be poured out through me and you into the world. And that's where we will find life being conformed more and more into the image of the Son. When we live this life, this Eucharistic love, we are on the path of joy that Jesus said, I tell you this, so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. And I'd just like to suggest that every time you receive Holy Communion, the Lord wants to amplify the fruits of the Holy Spirit in your life. And again, that's the best way to live as an evangelist. Get joyful. Have the fruits of the Holy Spirit ready. Patience, kindness, love, joy, peace, everything. That is his overflowing love to the world around us. He wants to fuel the fire and continue to win the world for the Father. As the Father has sent me, I died for you. I give you my body and my blood. I give you my passion for the world. And now I send you. And behold, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. I want to invite you to just relax. Ask the Lord what he wants you to focus on. And adoration will start in a few minutes.